Welcome to The Great Reveal. Pictures of Jesus in the Hebrew Bible with Dr. Richard Booker. In Luke 24, Jesus said that everything written in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and Psalms was about Him. This means the Jesus story begins in Genesis. How can this be? The story of Jesus' life revealed in pictures throughout the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. When you see the pictures, you see the person of Jesus. And when you see the person, you'll see yourself because you become part of the picture. Join Dr. Booker for these insightful teachings as your spiritual eyes open to see what was hidden is now revealed in each message of this exciting series. This time we're looking at the statement where Jesus said that uh, Moses wrote about me in John chapter five. And it's amazing that Christians don't ask the question, I wonder what Moses must have said about Jesus. How can that be? He was a long time before Jesus. <clears throat> well, the religious leaders had that same problem when, when uh, Jesus was dialoguing with them <clears throat> and he said, uh, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in it. <laughs> John 8, 56. And they got so furious with him. What in the world are you talking about, mister? In fact, we're not even going to call you mister. Anybody that's so crazy as you. You should have gone to our yeshiva, our seminary. <clears throat> You'd learn better. You're not even 50 years old. And Abraham's been dead all this time. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, hallelujah. <clears throat> they didn't have anything else to say. <laughs> so anyway, all of these things in the Hebrew Bible, we're looking at the first five books, the books of Moses, are pictures of a person. <clears throat> in the first testament, God spoke to the people in pictures. In the second testament, he spoke to them in the his in a person his son so the pictures lead us to the person this is what we're looking for these pictures so we did genesis now we're going to be looking at jesus revealing jesus in the book of exodus and it's so amazing that most of the pictures are found in the first five books of the bible the part that christians read the least probably we think the Jesus story starts in Matthew, it actually starts in Genesis. So the abundance of the pictures are in the first five books. So the best thing a Christian person can do, in addition to studying the New Testament, of course, is saturate your studies with the first five books because you will see the pictures. And when you see the pictures, you see the person. When you find the person, you find yourself because you live and move and have your being in him, and then you will automatically know all the rest of the Bible. Wow, because all the rest is just filling in some of the details of the pictures. So that would really be something for you to do. All right, so we're gonna look at just a few of the pictures here of Jesus in Exodus. Not all of them, but the big ones so we can see them. And I'm sure you'll be able to connect the dots as we go. So let's look at the first one here. This is the Exodus story, Exodus chapter 3, 7 and 8. <clears throat> the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, for I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hands of Egypt. <clears throat> so... We know what was going on here. God is going to deliver the Hebrews out of Egypt. All right, let's look at the next slide then. Now, this is going to be the Passover story, which all Christians know that story. Leviticus, we have to skip to Leviticus where it gives all the, you know, the feasts. 
23, 5, in the 14th day of the first month at evening is the Lord's Passover. Then on the 14th day, they were to kill the lamb and take some of the blood and place it on the two doorposts and the lintels of the houses. And that night they were to eat the lamb with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Let's just keep this one up there for a few minutes, okay? So in the Exodus story, we're looking for the pictures now, right? God said on the 10th day of the month, what day was that? 10th day of the month, select a lamb and observe the lamb for five days from the 10th to the 14th to make sure it's without spot and without blemish. And then <clears throat> on the 14th, they were to bring the lamb down to the doorpost, as you see in the picture of their house, and kill the lamb and take some of the blood and put it on the top and on both sides. And they get this blood from the threshold. It's translated as basin in English in the Exodus story. And that's a little um, confusing because basin can be something you're holding in your hand and you're dipping the blood from the blood in the basin. But actually the Hebrew word is threshold. If you can see the threshold here, uh, I had my assistant draw some blood there on the threshold because if, if you look at pictures of this story, you will never ever find any ever where there's blood on the threshold because they didn't understand what was actually going on. So Passover originally was called the, called the threshold covenant or the leaping over or crossing over covenant. It's because what happened in ancient times, had to watch the time here, every picture is an hour and a half, you know, is at the doorpost into their house, the entrance into their house, this is where ancient people worshiped their gods, long before temples and basilicas and public places they would go to. The doorway into their house was their altar. And so when, when they built a new house, as much as it would be a house, not like our houses, you know, but a new dwelling, they dedicated it to their gods. And the way they did it is they made a sacrifice, see, at the doorway, at the threshold. And they sprinkled the threshold with the blood of the sacrifice and all around, just like the Passover story. So when God told them to do this, it wasn't something they didn't already know about. See, it wasn't a new idea to them. The ancient world did this. God was just going to sanctify this for his own purposes and purify it and take the, the primitive paganism out of it. And so when they would kill the animal, dedicate their house to their God, this is where they had their weddings and all their festive activities because this was their altar. They were careful not to trample underfoot the blood of the sacred covenant they were making with their God. So they would leap over or step over See, right out of the book of Hebrews. And this is a whole nother teaching, you know, on the threshold. But this is why in newlyweds, the, the new husband carries his bride over the threshold because they're going to go in their inner sanctuary and cut a blood covenant between themselves. That's hours and hours on all of this, you know. But that's what all of this is about. It was a sacred covenant that the people were making, that God was making with the people. And when it says the, that uh, God will pass over, that means flying over the house, but it actually means that God, through the blood symbolizing it, would stand in the middle of the doorway and keep the angel of death out. So whoever had the blood applied to the door, God kept the angel of death out. He actually stood in the entrance way, keeping the angel of death out. And so they were to 
Select this lamb on the 10th, observe it on the five days, on the 14th, kill it at three o'clock in the afternoon. <clears throat> and spread the lamb out on the spit, shaped like a crossbar. God said, don't break any bones in the lamb and don't leave anything left over for the next day. So now this next slide, I have to prepare you a little bit. If you think you get your food from Kroger's and you've never been to an animal slaughterhouse, this can be a little gruesome picture to look at. So I'm just preparing you. Let's look at the next one here. The lamb on a crossbar. This is what it looks like. This is an actual picture of a lamb spread out on an iron spit, a metal spit shaped like a crossbar. And this is Exodus 12:46. You shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. So they had to spread the spit out on a the lamb out on a spit like a crossbar, just like this one or similar to spread it open in such a way they wouldn't break any bones. And you can see how, how the, the animal is spread out on this crossbar. So let's look at the next part of this picture. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken, John 19, 36. So what happened on the, t here's the person now coming to fulfill the picture, right? On the 10th day of the month, Jesus rode into Jerusalem to be set aside for the five days to be tested by the establishment. The religious leaders couldn't find any fault in him, but he was born to die as the Passover lamb. So on the 14th, as these lambs were being prepared back in Egypt, now in Jerusalem, Jesus is on the cross, and that evening at three o'clock in the afternoon, as the lambs are being sacrificed, Jesus dies on the cross. Now, this, it says in your gospels that the next day was a high Sabbath. So don't wanna offend anybody, can't get offended in the kingdom, amen. But it says a high Sabbath. That means it was not Saturday Sabbath, it was a high Sabbath. Just read Leviticus 23, your favorite chapter in the Bible, I'm sure, and you'll see the list of the high Sabbaths. It was the next Passover was called the preparation day for the next day, which was the high Sabbath, which was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the religious leader said to Pilate, the next day is a high Sabbath. <clears throat> it's a special feast day for us. Take that imposter down so there's nothing of him left over for the next day. Wow. Isn't that amazing? And they went to break his bones, you remember. They broke the bones of the thieves crucified with him. And they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead. And they didn't break his bones because if you break the bones in the legs, the person can't push up with his heel anymore and catch any breath in his lungs. And he just sags down and suffocates and dies. Well, they found that Jesus was already dead. And so what do we have? Not one bone in the lamb was broken. You see the picture? You see how the dots are being connected here? Or we might say the pixels forming the little pictures in the movies or whatever we have today for these things. It's also for interesting that threshold it's amazing. In Hebrew, the Hebrew word for threshold is uh, crossbar, just, just like this. And the Arabic word is carpenter. You can look all these things up yourself. So what we have is a threshold, Pastor, is a picture of a bloody carpenter carrying a crossbar. Wow. Somebody say, wow, again. Wow. Say it backwards. Wow. 
<laughs> That's how detailed God is with these pictures. So Passover, the threshold covenant, the carpenter carrying his crossbow, he acted out in reality every detail of the, pic the pictures that were about him that the Hebrews had been acting out. It was like a dress rehearsal, see? So that's what the Hebrew Bible is, is a dress rehearsal in vis with visual aids in picture form of what the person would do in reality when he would come. All right, let's look at the next slide then, please. We're going to move forward to Mount uh, Sinai, where God is going to come down in fire and thunder, and it was a loud noise. Now, God had called them out of Egypt, but they didn't know who he was, so he had to introduce himself. And the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments, were his calling card, like you go call on somebody, here's my card, this is who I am, this is what I represent. So this is going to be God revealing himself, God's calling card. Now we want to look at the picture and see if we can find the picture. And if you see the picture, as Christian believers, you'll automatically see the person. The challenge we have is, it's not a criticism, it's just the way it is. We've been taught the Bible as a Western book, when it's a Middle Eastern book, written by Middle Eastern people with a Hebraic mind. And so sometimes when the things that are in the Bible get translated into English, the translators, all well-meaning, don't always have that Hebraic understanding of what was actually really happening. We, Peggy and I were listening to a famous preacher, teacher on TV last night at the hotel room in the nearby areas. We were getting closer to coming over here because <clears throat> we live a ways out. And this person is world famous and does a fantastic job in many ways helping people. And the person came right out and said, now this thing, I don't understand why Jesus did this. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, I, I got so frustrated, I turned to Peggy. I'm gonna tell you what I said. I said, this person has no idea what the Bible is even about. World renowned, doing great, helping a lot of people. But when it came down to certain stories about Jesus being acting out the, the pictures, this person had no idea. <laughs> I mean, just admitted it to millions of people. And it was a, it's a simple thing. If you understand these are Jews writing these stories, not Dallas Theological Seminary graduates. Are you with me? So you have to spend time. I've spent 40 plus years of my life studying the culture of the Bible. Not to know the culture itself, but to see how these were pictures in the culture. Because Jesus, being a Jewish man, he, he only did what was in the first five books. <laughs> you see? So if you study them real well, you'll understand what he's doing and what he's talking about. So here's Exodus 19. 18 and 19. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Hallelujah. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. These were the original Quakers here. Hallelujah. Smoke and fire, the same thing that Abraham saw passing through the pieces of flesh Back in Genesis 15, right, Pastor? So a smoking furnace and a burning lamp. Was, the glory of God was coming through the pieces of flesh. Now it's here. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. And you know, you know that story. But there's a little bit to the Hebraic that 
I never heard, you know, in a Western kind of sermon. Because what's actually happening here? First of all, God calls them up to the foot of the mountain. It says it's in the morning. Now, it doesn't give the exact time, but when they're going to have the morning sacrifice, it's nine o'clock in the morning. Be thinking, nine o'clock in the morning. Oh, these folks are drunk. How can that be? It's only nine in the morning. Oh, God calls them up to the foot of the mountain. And some mixed multitude, you might remember, it says, came out of Egypt. It wasn't just the Hebrews. It was all kind of people came out who followed them out of bondage, out of Egypt. And so all these people are at the foot of the mountain. They speak all these different languages, all kinds of cultures. They've been Egyptianized, but now they've come out. They're going to have this new God. God's going to tell them what he expects of them and who he is. How is he going to talk to them in all their different languages? It, it says in the English that they uh, saw these the smoke and fire, but actually what happened was God spoke to the people in their languages and what they saw and heard was tongues of fire coming out of the fire of Mount Sinai, speaking to them in voices and in, in languages they can understand. Let me read Psalm 29, seven to you. It says, the voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. Isn't that something? That's going back to this situation here. So they heard God speak to them in tongues of fire, all hearing in their own languages, this mixed multitude. And Moses gets up and speaks and gives a sermon to them representing God. And all that was awesome, but there was a downside. You remember they had the golden calf issue? And because of that rebellion, do you remember what happened? 3,000 died under the holy fire of God. And God wrote his words on tablets of stone. Now, fast forward again. 1,500 years, and let's look at the next slide. Well, we've read, we've read the Exodus one. They trembled and stood afar off, okay. They witnessed the thundering and lightning flashes, it, but it, it, they saw tongues of fire as the Hebraic mind of it coming out. The sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking, the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Okay, let's fast forward 1,500 years, and we have the same exact situation, but this time, instead of being in the desert at Mount Sinai, it's in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. Exactly the same situation is going to happen here, and God is going to come down in fire. And when he did, there was this great shaking in great noise, this is happening on the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount you read about in the news all the time and see on the television and in your videos. That same Temple Mount. This is where the disciples were waiting for the coming of the Spirit, the promise of the Father. And there they are. It's on the 6th of Sivan, which is the same day that God came down on Sinai. It's uh, June, July on the Gentile calendar. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Everybody, there'd be hundreds of thousands of people in Jerusalem there for the feast, for Shavuot, Pentecost, we call it. So hundreds of thousands of Jews from all over are all around, just like in Sinai. And they hear this noise. They hear the wind whistling through. It's a big commotion. 
and they run to the foot of the Temple Mount to see what's going on, just like back in Sinai. And they hear God speaking through the people, these ignorant Galileans in tongues of fire and all these languages from all these people from all over the near area of the Middle East. As far as Rome and all around, Jews had come. That's how when the Apostle Paul went to so many of these places, there was a group of believers there. They'd been here, see. Hallelujah. And so, Acts 2, 1 to 4, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, was the day that God gave the law to the people. They were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues, that's right out of the Psalms that I read to you, as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So all these people rush to this place where all this is going on, just like back in Sinai. Now instead of Moses getting up to speak, Peter gets up to speak. Instead of 3,000 dying, it says 3,000 gladly received his word, were baptized, and entered into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Amen. And again, can we give the Lord a hand clap for that? Amen. And so what happened, God is going to do the same thing, but this time he's going to write his laws on the fleshly tablets of their hearts by giving them the spirit of God. And so you, you see the picture that's pointing to the person. And because Jesus promised that he would do this before he left, this action right here was a, um, a fulfillment and a witness that he indeed was sitting at the right hand of the Father. Angels, principalities, and powers being made subject unto him. Because this happened as he said it would, or if it had not happened, what he said would have been a lie. And so people try to say all kind of things about Jesus. And somebody wrote one time, well, you can't have all those choices. He's either a liar, he's a lunatic, I'm the bread of life. I mean, you got to be crazy. Have you heard anybody say, I'm the light of the world lately? No. You're either a liar, a lunatic, or you're Lord. Hallelujah. Those are the three choices every human has to make. And when you look at all the overwhelming evidence, there's only one true answer. He is who he said he was and is. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's keep going quickly. Exodus 24, 7 and 8. So God is there with them. And then he gives all these instructions on stone tablets to Moses for the people. And then it says he took the book of the covenant. Can you say that phrase, book of the covenant? He took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. And they responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you according in accordance with all these words. So notice. Shalom, have a ring. Hello, friends. I hope you're enjoying the teaching such a blessing and honor to share it with you. Just a little break here. It's interesting in John chapter 5, verses 45 to 46, Jesus was having a discussion with the religious leaders. And he said, Moses wrote about me. Wow, what an amazing statement. Jesus said that Moses wrote about Jesus. That is amazing. 
You know, as followers of Jesus, it would be a good question that we should ask ourselves, what in the world did Moses write about Jesus? How can that be? Because we kind of think the Jesus story starts in Matthew, but no, it really starts in Genesis. How can it be that Moses wrote about Jesus? Well, he did it through the customs and the culture and the traditions and practices of the people in the culture of the Bible. As they went about their everyday lives, their customs and traditions and practices, through them they were acting out in a visual way the drama of redemption. Isn't that amazing? But here's our challenge, as particularly if we live in the Western world, that culture is so foreign to us, we don't see this drama being acted out. We don't see that the Hebrew Bible is a picture of a person, Jesus of Nazareth, or Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And because we don't know that culture, we don't see that the pictures are there. So we miss this whole incredible revelation that Jesus mentioned that Moses wrote about him. And it makes the Bible come alive with such excitement and freshness and power that we often miss if we read it as a Western book. Sometimes I say, and I've heard others say, that reading the Bible through Western eyes is like reading it in black and white. But when you get into the culture, it's like reading it in full color, high definition. And I know that's what you want in your time spent in the Bible. That's why I'm making this amazing series called The Great Reveal, where I'm taking you back into the culture of the Bible so we can see for ourselves how it was that Moses wrote about Jesus. So we're going to be posting a new one every month on my website, www.rbooker.com and be on my YouTube page. So we'll be telling you more about that later. I hope you'll be looking for it the first of each month for quite a long time. The Great Reveal, Jesus, hidden pictures of him in the Hebrew Bible. How did Moses write about Jesus? So I hope you'll be able to join with us I'll tell you more about it at the end of this teaching, but right now, let's get back to the teaching. God bless you and enjoy. So notice that what Moses did, he took the blood. It has put, he dipped a hyssop, little hyssop shrub bush uh, branch in the blood and dipped it over all these, sprinkled it over all these stone tablets. Now hyssop carries, it grows in the Middle East, it carries water in the stem. So when he smacked the blood on top of these stone tablets, the water oozed out of the blood, sealing, out of the hyssop, sealing the blood into the stone tablets. So when God looked down at the tablets, he saw them covered with the blood, sealed with the water, as a witness that even though he knew they would never keep all these, he didn't see that. He saw it covered with the blood. It's always been his way. All right, let's keep going. Hebrews 9, 19 and 20. For when every commandment has been spoken by Moses and to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded to you. So it's a blood covenant story. It's not about the Jews were saved by, quote, unquote, keeping the law. And now Jesus has come along and we're saved by grace through faith. That's just not the way it is in the Bible. Everyone who's ever, as we would use the word, been saved the same way, by grace through faith in the blood of the innocent substitutionary sacrifice for sin, we saw how God covered Adam and Eve with the garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness. So he says, behold, the blood of the covenant. It's a sacred covenant in blood, always and forever. 
So Jesus didn't change anything. He just blew the cobwebs off of man's traditions that they had added on top of God's word. And when he was in these conversations and constantly rebuking them, he wasn't rebuking them of the, for the word of God, but for all of their traditions they added on top and they became a great, a great burden on the people because they tried to enforce all their traditions on the people and actually gave them equal weight to the word of God itself, much like many Christian denominations do that same thing today. So we don't have any stones to throw at that religious establishment because our modern ones have done about the same thing. Can I have an amen? amen. That was kind of weak. Amen. Thank you. All right, let's keep going here. All right, now we're going to look at the tabernacle for just a few minutes and, and just briefly go through. And this is a, like a 12-week lesson right here, you know, 12 hours at least. Exodus 25, 8. And let them make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell in their midst. God wanted to come dwell among them. That's still his desire today. They had an incomplete sacrifice, so he couldn't come and dwell in them because the blood of bulls and goats can only cover sin. It can't take them away. So he drew as close to them as he could. And so let them make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell in their midst. In Exodus 25, 9, according to all which I'm going to reveal to you, the plan of the tabernacle and the plan of all of its vessels, even so you shall do. So God showed Moses and later King David this pattern in heaven. And they had a spiritual revelation, a spiritual vision. And God was saying, this is what, the Holy of Holies is like in heaven. This is what my throne room is like in heaven. This is the pattern in heaven. So make a copy and put it here on the earth so people can see how to approach me. So let's look at the tabernacle furnishings here real quick, like on the next slide. Okay. Now, uh, here's just a, a little drawing of it. Exodus 25, 8, again, and let them make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell in their midst. So you see it has three sections to it, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. Can we say that together? The outer court, the, outer court. the holy, place, holy place, and the holy of holies. holy of holies. Okay, now God dwells in the holy of holies. So the objective was to get there. But because they had an incomplete sacrifice, only the high priest could go in that room in only one time of year. And only the priest could go in the outer room, the holy place. Everybody else had to wait outside in the courtyard. Well, that's not right where God is, but it's better than anybody else had. <laughs> so they were grateful for that. <clears throat> but there's only one way in. Did I say only one way in? through this eastern opening called the gate. The same eastern gate that's there in Jerusalem today, that one's about 20 feet underground, the one that was in the first century temple of Jesus' time. That eastern gate that Jesus rode through, that's about 20 feet underneath the present eastern gate that you see in your, your books and movies. Peg and I have been up to the Eastern Gate. There's a big Muslim cemetery in front of it. That's a whole nother 30 minute teaching, but you can't get up to it. But Meg and I led groups to Israel for 30 years and we had favor with different people. And we were able to walk through the sacred Muslim cemetery right up to the Eastern Gate and actually lay our hands on the Eastern Gate and have a prayer that Messiah will soon come and blow it wide open. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, this is the tabernacle, though, right now. And so there's an eastern gate, only one way in. And there's two items out in the courtyard, two pieces of furniture, the altar and the laver. So the first thing that you're faced with when you come in 
through the eastern gate is an altar where you make sacrifices. So what does that mean? You can't come to God unless you have a sacrifice. It's either you or the animal. How many of you would choose the animal? Because animals do not have spirits. They're not made in the image of God. God allowed in humane ways for them to be used as sacrifices to take our place because he doesn't like human sacrifices as the pagans did. And so here we have to have a sacrifice. So there's the altar and you make your sacrifice there. You place your hand on the head of the animal, heavily leaning, it says in the Bible. You heavily lean, it's identification. You're identifying with the animal your sins symbolically on the animal. None of this is pretty. We can have a sanitized, we get it at Kroger's, you know, but none of this is pretty. You put your hand, you heavily lean on the animal's head and you can feel it squirming and kicking as it's dying. They all understood much better than us the horror of sin because this animal was dying for their sins. That's the first thing you have is a sacrifice to come closer to God. And then the next item in there, furnished piece of furniture, is the laver, the water, where the water is. So the priest would wash there at the laver. And after you make your sacrifice, after you kill the animal, the next place is the water. So what are we looking at here? The blood and the water. See, pictures of a person. You make the sacrifice at the altar, and washing at the laver, the blood and the water. Of course, we can see clearly as ones whose eyes have been opened spiritually to see Yeshua or Jesus here. When they pierced him in the side, what happened? Blood and water flowed out of his side, and he said, it is finished. Don't have to do this anymore. The once and for all perfect sacrifice has been made. Hallelujah. We don't need to have a hitching post back here, Pastor, to tie the lamb to. The lamb's already been tied to the hitching post. It's called the cross. Amen. So the altar is pointing to the cross, the laver. You come to the cross and give your life to Jesus as the one who died for your sins, he gives you the living waters of the Holy Spirit. You see that? That's the courtyard. So, I mean, it's ours, but we, we're just getting the big pieces here. So every Hebrew had to do that and the courtyard. But God's not there, but you're approaching him. It says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It means the Hebrew word is Corban. The offerings were a way that God gave for the people to draw near to him. Okay, so we're going to go now into this outer room called the holy place. There's another curtain there. You can't just wander in, you know, any old way. You have to go through in God's divine order. And there's three items in there. The lampstand on the left and the table of showbread on the right and the incense altar back there uh, in between in front of the other curtain. If you looked at all of this on looking it down at like this, it's all in the shape of a cross, the way these are placed in, in the tabernacle. So the altar, the laver, the lampstand, the table of showbread, the incense altar, then you're gonna go into the Holy of Holies. So here we have the lampstand. <clears throat> The eternal flame, the eternal light, it's a picture there of pointing to the one who would come as the light of the world. Amen. And so the priest would come there and trim, trim the wicks regularly to keep the light going as an eternal flame. And you had to pour oil in there, you know, and then trim the wicks. And so it's also a picture of the followers of Jesus because he said, you're now going to be the light of the world when I give you the oil of the Holy Spirit but in order to shine bright sometimes it's necessary to trim your wicks 
So every Christian needs to have some wick trimming time to keep our lights shining bright. Amen. So all of that lampstand is a picture of Jesus, the light of the world, and him putting the oil of the Spirit in us so that we can be that light as well. And then right across is the table of showbread. It's bread and wine. Guess what? We call it communion. It was sitting there for 1,500 years, and this, every Shabbat, the priest would go in. Only the priest could go in this room and eat the bread, drink the wine, what was left, pour out, replace it every Shabbat. And it was a picture again that Jesus would come as the living bread of God. He said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, covenant talk, he didn't mean it literally, spiritually speaking, I will be in you, you will be in me, and the two of us will become one. And so this is there, that table of showbread, the covenant meal is what we would also call it. It was there all these centuries, almost 1,500 years, as a picture of the person who would come as the bread of life. And then right past those, between them, is the incense altar, which was the prayer altar. So the priest would bring hot coals from the altar out there in the courtyard, bring it in, put it on that, put the incense on it. <laughs> Boy, it would billow up this sweet, sweet aroma that would fill up the whole room. And he's standing there in that, you know, basking in that sweet aroma. And it's a symbol of prayer in the Bible. So there again we have a picture. For 1,500 years, Jesus comes along and says, you're going to be praying in my name. And whatever you ask of the Father, he will do. It's, it's, it's not the whatever, it's the praying in his name, which means to pray in his nature, pray in his character, pray in his likeness, pray in his will. So naturally, if we're praying in the will of God, God is obligated to answer that kind of prayer. Amen. A covenant prayer based on the word of God and his promises for us. So right there is a symbol sweet fragrant incense of the name of Jesus to his Father in heaven. Well, the, how, the, all the priests could go in there, and this was their ministry of the priests. This was where the priests ministered before the Lord on behalf of the people, keeping the wicks trim for the lampstand, replenishing the bread and the wine, keeping the coals on the incense altar going. So this was priestly ministry. Again, the everyday Hebrew couldn't go in. He's out there in the courtyard. There's one more room in this thick curtain. It's 30 minutes just on the curtains, you know, and all the colors, what they mean, colors of redemption. But one day of the year, Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, uh, the high priest would go behind the veil and he would take the blood from the sacrifice and seven times he would sprinkle it over what? What was in that room? The Ark of the Covenant, right? You saw the movie, you know what was in there. The Ark of the Covenant. It was like the throne room of God and the throne of God. This is where the glory cloud of God was coming up outside of the, through the top of the tent, in the Holy of Holies. And there was three items in the Ark of the Covenant. And none of them were good for the people's sake because they reminded God of their sins. One was the pot of manna. You remember that story in Numbers? God gave them all the manna. All, they didn't have to go to the bakery or nothing. It's just right out there for them. And they complained constantly. God, don't you have some bacon and eggs this morning? Well, God doesn't eat bacon, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Murmured and complained constantly. And God said, Moses, take a pot of manna and put it in the Ark of the Covenant. 
Every day, God would look down, see how they murmured and complained, rejected his earthly provision. That's not good. Something else in there was Aaron's staff, a rod that budded, if you might remember that story. They had a challenge, who's going to be the priest of God? God said, throw your man's staff down, and Aaron's going to throw his down, whichever one buds to life. There was resurrection life in it. That's my man. Well, the bad news is theirs didn't bud. Aaron's did. God said, put it in there. Put it in the ark. Every day, God would look down and see how they rejected his priestly leadership, his spiritual leadership. They had a better plan. It's called religion, not relationships. God would look down, and he was not happy with that. They rejected his spiritual leadership. One more thing in there, the stone tablets. Moses put the stone tablets in there. Every day, God would look down and see the stone tablets. It was a reminder how they had broken his, tab his laws, had the big orgy, and they didn't even know what the laws were, you know. The golden calf story, all their sins constantly rebelling. Put it in there, God looks down and sees how they broke his moral laws every day except that one day of the year. Aaron, go into the Holy of Holies, sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice seven times, picture of a perfect atonement that's coming. And God would look down. He would not see the evidence of their sin. He would see the blood. And it was the blood that changed God's throne from one of judgment to one of mercy. That's why the lid is called the mercy seat of God. Can you see it's all the same story everywhere you are? The pictures pointing to the person. There's a little bit down here at the bottom here. These three sections represented three phases in our walk with God. The outer court is a picture of salvation. You come to the cross, you make a genuine commitment of your life to the Lord. You may not fully understand what all that means, but it's genuine heartfelt. You're coming into the courtyard. You're coming towards God. And you receive the living waters of the Holy Spirit. We call that being born again or born from above. You have a new spirit. God has now written his laws on the fleshly tablets of your heart. That's what we call the salvation experience. This is where millions of our good denominational brothers and sisters come to and stay because they don't know that God has anything more for them. God bless everyone. We Most of us have been in that place at one time. So it's not a condemnation or criticism. It's the reality. People said the sinner's prayer, and that's all they've ever done. They've never gone on with God, and they think, well, okay, I'm going to be kind of a nice person, die and go to heaven. They've never got heaven down here to glory fill their soul. Hallelujah. Kingdom has never come to live in them. They're saved, and they're going to heaven if it's real, but they live their whole life out in the courtyard. Isn't that sad? Millions of us were such as those at one time. I'd rather be dead than go back. How can you go back? Then millions of more have said, oh, God's got more. I see it right here in the book. It's not in my denominational handbook, but it's right here in the book. Come on, somebody, help me out. And they're going into the holy place. That's the place of service. It's where the priest serves. So the Bible says all of God's people are priests of the Most High God. We all have a priestly ministry to carry out to others. 
we're God containers on this planet. When you walk into a public place, the atmosphere should change because God has just walked in there inside you. Everybody that's troubled in that restaurant should be drawn to your light. Everywhere you go, people are troubled. If you just are aware of your environment and look around, you'll see who's troubled. They wear, we wear it on our face. You go over and speak a word of love to them. They start boo-hooing, put their head on your shoulder right in the middle of the restaurant, start telling you all their problems. You're priests of the Most High God. But they, 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 they got an anointing of the Holy Spirit in that room, that lampstand, that oil came upon them, was poured on them. And they got an anointing for power to serve. Didn't happen in the courtyard, happened in the holy place. And their light began to shine. They began to minister. Today, the great majority of believers in the world are third world, non-white, Pentecostal. That means they've been into the holy place. That's what that means. Not literally, but spiritually. You understand what I'm saying to you? They've had a holy place experience. They've had an encounter with God that came on them and empowered them to be ministering priests of the Most High God. They're not satisfied sitting out there in the courtyard. They want to be out telling the good news, helping people, washing people's feet, taking them groceries, buying them their refrigerator, sharing the good news of Jesus with them, helping people who are need or in need. They're out ministering. It's wonderful, and they, they, they got a good prayer life, the incense altar. As wonderful as all that is, we're almost through here now. God wasn't in that room either. <laughs> so serving God is not nearly as important as knowing him. One of the occupational hazards of being a minister is you get so worn out and burned out and stressed out serving God, helping the people, that you often lose your intimacy with God. That's what the Holy of Holies is. That's where God's presence is. But only the high priest could go in there. But now, when Jesus came along, you remember what happened when he was crucified? That veil was split from top to bottom in the temple, making a way for all of us can now go right in to the presence of God, hallelujah. We don't have to wait out in the courtyard. We don't have to sit on the back row. We can get up front, hallelujah, up close, up close and personal with our Father in heaven. We can get the anointing of the Spirit in the holy place to be on fire for God and be able to make a difference, make a difference in your family, in your community on the job you're the light of the world you're the salt of the earth you're the people that the people out there are looking for somebody real that has a relationship with Jesus because the veil has been split we can all go right into the presence of God and behold him in his blazing glory and his dazzling beauty and have an up close and personal relationship with our Father in heaven. These are a few of the pictures in Exodus pointing to the person. So as we close, I give you the challenge. Where are you in your walk with God? You just kind of complacent, hanging around, happy in the courtyard, just kind of 
going through life with no meaning and purpose, just, yay, Jesus is Lord, amazing grace, and that's it, you know? <laughs> or you got into the holy place, if you had an encounter, Examine ourselves. Is, is God using you to make a difference? If not, there's there's something for you. He has something for you. And if you've gotten there, do you spend time with Him to the more you spend time with Him, the more you will be like Him. Beholding him in his blazing glory, his dazzling beauty, his greatness and his goodness, his majesty, his mercy, his power and his purity, his charisma and his character, and all that he is. The world is waiting to see that in us. Amen and amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Shalom again, everyone. I truly hope you were blessed by the teaching. It's such an honor to share it with you. And I want to give you some information here now that is ways that we can work together, not only to help you in your walk with God, but take this important message. If it really means a lot to you and it's helping you, you can partner with us to help bring this message to so many other people all around the world. In this modern electronic age, it's amazing with such little effort how we can reach so many people with the Word of God. So let me tell you a few things that we can do together, okay? Number one, you can go to my website at www.rbooker.com and you can order so many different things that will help you really for the rest of your life. There are many, many books there. Many of them have study guides. You can order them right from our website. You can study them on your own. You can use them in your home groups. You can use them in your Sunday school class. It's so easy and they're really well balanced and focused on Jesus and they give you a Hebraic cultural understanding of the Bible. While there, you can go to our resources tab and check out our courses that we have with the Institute for Hebraic Christian Studies. IHCS is much simpler to say, has all these courses listed. We have uh, students from all over the world who take them, and you can take these courses yourself. We have a free download. Did I say free? Oh, absolutely. It's called The Root and Branches. If you go to your app store, it's an amazing multimedia presentation of the basic core Hebraic teachings in the Bible. It's got the PowerPoint pictures. It's got video, audio. It's a beautiful presentation, and it's free for you. Just go to your app store, type in Root and Branches, and it'll come up for you. If you're interested, you could contact us about hosting me and your church or congregation or a home group. We still at our young age travel all over the world helping people and if it's possible, we'd be honored to come and speak to your group. Now, we're making these videos uh, for you at no charge and we're glad to do that. But uh, if you wanna partner with us and, and be a part of this ministry you can join with us and help us uh, by being a financial partner and we'll use your funds to help reproduce more of these products get them distributed all over the world prepare people for the coming of the messiah so you can join with us financially through paypal by making donations from our website or the old-fashioned way you know with a check or money order you can send the sounds of the trumpet. We'll put that on the screen for you at 4747 Research Forest Drive, 180-330, Spring, Texas, 77381. We'd love to hear from you. Love to have us work together, do something bigger than what we can do for ourselves. And so let me close this way by giving you this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom. God bless you until we visit again with the next teachings. Amen and amen.